Three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, October 20th, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to effectively conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fass, please call the role of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Jose. Present. Ms. Stolesky. Present. Ms. Hassan. Present. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ms. Fass. And please call the role of staff members on the committee um, participating in today's meeting. Dr. Yarborough. Mr. Handy. Present. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Fast, please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in today's meeting. Ms. Ferguson. Dr. Roberts. Sorry, present. Couldn't get my oh, ear okay. on. Ms. Ferguson and Dr. Roberts are present. Thank you. Ms. Hamlet. Here. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and are there any other members who've joined us today that are participating on the call? Dr. Jeffrey Holmes, Senior Executive Director, Curriculum and Instruction. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, and we will start with our first um, set of new business, which is how residency is established and the residency investigation process. And for that, we have Mr. Douglas Handy, presented by Ms. Hamlet. All right, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, so as Ms. Scott stated, we do have our uh, primary presentation this evening is on um, the residency and residency investigation. So um, at this point, I will turn it over to, uh, I'm actually going to start with uh, Ms. Ferguson just to see if she has any introductory remarks before turning it her over to uh, her staff. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you all um, how our people personnel offices or our members of our people personnel office um, investigate residency um, issues that are um, happening without, throughout Baltimore County schools. Um, we have today with us Ms. Erica Hamlet, who is the coordinator of People Personnel Services. And we also have Dr. Dr. Kevin Roberts, who is the director of School Climate and Culture. I'm going to turn it over to them. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here um, to talk about residency and our residency investigation process. Um, with that, we can go into our PowerPoint. So we're, our, object, our objective today is talking about enrolling into Baltimore County Public Schools and how residency is established and the residency investigation process. Next slide. We hope to accomplish in our outcomes to provide an overview of policy and rule pertaining to enrollment. We want to identify documents required to establish residency and we also want to outline the residency investigation process. Next slide. So the policy and rule that governs this process is 5150, which is verification of residency in Baltimore County schools. A school aged child whose parent must have an established bona fide domicile. They must have an established guardianship and or have been placed in a foster or group home by a licensed private county or state agency placement agency, such as Department of Social Services. Next 
So under policy rule, policy and rule 5150, we also do special enrollments, which must be approved by PPW. Those special enrollments consist of kinship enrollments, hardship enrollments, agency place enrollments, and homeless enrollments. Each one of those homeless are uh, approved by our PPWs and they have specific qualifications that um, we look at when we're trying to make um, placement, not placement, enrollment decisions on these special enrollments. Verification of residency. And before I get into that, I want to go back a little bit into the kinship, hardship. If we can go back a slide just to give a little bit more clarification about those points, please. Thank you. So when we're looking at kinship, we're looking at a student who has been placed with a family member who because of a special circumstance. So for example, if a parent has died and the student is placed with a grandmother, a, a, a um, aunt, a aunt, a uncle, somebody who is blood related, that is considered a kinship and that is the type of enrollment. And what that, that person has to provide is proof of whatever the situation is. So for example, in a kinship, if they said the parent has died, then they would give us documentation of that, a death certificate, an ob uh, obituary announcement, something that establishes that hardship. In a hardship situation, this person does not have to be related. They are um, a person who might have them, you know, we get a lot of godparents, friends of family, um, somebody who is not blood related, who has the child for, it could be the same reason, death of a parent. It could be um, the child is uh, come from out of the country. It can be um, a, a financial situation. It could be a, a, a plethora of things that provide a hardship, but in any case, they have to provide their documentation to support what the hardship is. So if they're saying that the, that the parents have abandoned the child and that they have this child, they provide us documentation of such. The documentation could include their tax returns that show that they have been caring for this child for the year. It could show, it could be um, that they put the child on their insurance, that they have medical assistance for this child, or, or that they take the child to all their doctor's appointments and they have documentation of such things. And so in any case, with all of our um, different types of special enrollments, they have to document exactly the reason for the application itself. Agency placed students are all of our group homes, our Department of Social Service children who are displaced from their families and placed in an agency. What they do is they apply through an application. They give us proof that the child is in placement and what that placement looks like is a court order or it can be a placement letter. And then the PPW will make that approval. Um, and those are, that's how those students are placed into Baltimore County Public Schools, depending on the area of where the foster parent is residing at that time. So as you can imagine, we have foster parents all around Baltimore County. So we have students who are in placement all around Baltimore County. Um, but the first initial step is the DSS worker reaches out to the PPW and provides that application and that documentation to support that that child is in placement. And that placement can come from not just Baltimore County DSS, we're looking at agencies all around the state of Maryland. And sometimes we get interstate compact agencies, meaning students who are coming from out of state. And that's a special um, packet of information. They actually have to go through the supporting county, which is for us as Baltimore County, and then complete the, our actual applications that we need for enrollment. And then we have our homeless students who are displaced. And um, when they come for an enrollment, the family doesn't have to provide any documentation. Um, a lot of times they will give our PPWs like an eviction or something that shows that they are di displaced. But those children, when they indicate that they, um, when the families indicate that they're homeless, they have a right to enroll. They can enroll at their school of origin or they can enroll at the school closest to where they live. And so all of these four categories are our special enrollments. And once again, they are approved by our PBWs under 5150, but they all require minus homelessness documentation to support the special enrollment. Next slide, please. 
So verification of residency. This is where we have to provide, parents have to provide proof that their child is domiciled in Baltimore County. And the burden of establishing a bona fide domicile is with the parent. So what do they have to provide? They have to provide proof of home ownership or they need to provide a lease, a current lease. Um, they, and just something that shares that they are the actual resident for that home. They also have to provide photo identification to indicate that they are in fact the parent. And then we need three documents that in, within 60 days um, from the day that they're enrolling. So as of today, if a parent wanted to enroll in new into Baltimore County, it would be 60 days from today's date. And so those are the uh, required documents that we need to establish residency, or uh, well, that a parent needs to establish residency in Baltimore County Public Schools. Next slide, please. So those required documents, what do they look like? These are just a few samples. So a photo identification could be a driver's license. It could be a work ID, it could be a school ID. It's what we're doing is verifying the fact that the parent is who they are. Required documents for um, proof of home ownership, D, title, tax assessment, something that verifies the fact that the person owns the home. Is it a lease? It must be a current signed lease um, that, the, that the parent has to, to verify they in fact have the right to occupy that property. If it was a private party lease, because we do have a lot of people renting from a private party, then we, we get that lease, but we also get the proof that the homeowner in fact is a Baltimore County resident and owns that home. In terms of documentation to support the 60 day um, rule that we have, these are examples, bank statements, current bills, medical bills, voter registration, tax returns, W-2s, letters from employers, um, anything that provides first class mail. It could be businesses. It could be your visa statement. Um, you know, we have a, a, a lot of documentation sources, and so parents just have to give us first class documentation to prove that they reside at that residence. Next slide, please. The investigation process, and, and let me just also stop because I'm, I'm not sure if I put this in off the top of my head, but we do have a shared domicile process. And in people who are a shared domicile, they are living with a family in our area. And so they have to provide the 60, the three pieces of mail within 60 days. They have to have provide the proof of home ownership or current lease as stated before, but they, also provide a shared domicile application that they get notarized, that it provides proof that they are with the homeowner as well as themselves. So they both go and get that application signed and attach it to the additional documentation. The investigation process. So if we get a referral to the Office of People Services to investigate a residency, um, sometimes we might get it through a tip hotline, sometimes we get an anonymous phone call, sometimes it originates from the school because they get return mail, they see a student being picked up late every day all the time, they see a student getting an MTA bus, they see a student who should be on a school bus but he is being picked up, there are a lot of different factors that could stimulate a residency investigation. Um, so if we get that, the pupil personnel worker will get a referral. Referrals can come in many forms. Sometimes they'll email the referral. Sometimes they'll call and say, hey, this situation is going on. Can you activate on this? Um, and so, you know, we advise our staff, you know, when a school is reaching out, we want to reach out, you know, as, as quickly as possible so that we can be responsive to their needs. Um, the school must complete a preliminary investigation before sending a referral of investigation. So we're asking the school, you know, was mail returned? Uh, have you called the family? Did they move? Are they still in your area or in the catchment zone? Because we don't want to just assume that somebody is doing something negatively or just being fraudulent for no reason. We, we do ask that the school do some preliminary work just to let us know, you know, some things can be solved with a quick phone call or a quick conversation with parents. So, but these are examples of things that would prompt a resident to referral, mail return, or a student sharing with a staff member that he has moved, he or she has moved. 
Next slide, please. Some of our investigative techniques and tools that we use, first and first and foremost, we want to talk to the parent. We want to have a conversation. You know, we want to, like I said, we don't want to make assumptions about situations without making that connection. You know, it's all about building relationships and, risk and establishing respect. And so we contact our parents. Hey, we see that there's mail return. We see that um, your Johnny is no longer taking the bus that, you know, he has as you know is is situation going on so we make that contact we try to make that connection so that you know we're, we're reaching out you know authentically um so that we can establish relationships we also do desktop research and so some of the advantages that we have is we have maryland case search where it allows us to be able to view you know a, a parent's background in case they have some judiciary issues or um uh you know, just kind of things that might cause them to be in the Maryland system. We're able to research um, through case search and case search kind of gives us plethora of information. It'll give us um, last address, you know, phone numbers, um, you know, last reported that this person used this address. So, you know, it gives us some uh, some background information that's that's, you know, quite helpful. We can do a BGE &E search, you know, we can see if a parent has BGE &E in their name at this at the home uh, that they're saying they live at, or maybe it pops up in another address, you know. Um, so that's just a kind of tool that we use to kind of to see what we have. We also have a system that we pay for called Accurant. Um, through our office and accurate is a um, system that we're using that um, it is managed. Actually, it's like a, it's, I think it's a federal system, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, we have to be very cautious when we use this because we have to sign that we're not using it to search celebrities or, you know, famous, you know, people or whatever. So um, we use this very, very cautiously, but it does give detailed report on where people are. And so when our, um, PPWs want to do an accurate re research. Um, they will reach out to our residency investigation investigators who manage that. They fill out a request, and then the residency investigators. We only have um, five permissions for that research because it's so pri because it's so detailed. Um, and so they do the research and get back to the PPW that information um, that's needed. So that is uh, one of our. Uh, uses that we have in our toolkit. We also use MBA. MBA will let us know where, this, where the parent's car is registered, their last known address for that car, um, and or their license, their last known address. We also use real property search, and um, this is vital in terms of helping us figure out um, who actually owns the home at the time. Real property search is not always in real time though, because if a person just bought a home and then you search real property search, you're not gonna see the new home owner. It takes um, a, a little bit of time before that, doc, that, um, that website is updated. Um, we also search land records where we can find deeds um, and it'll tell us who the originators who own the home. And it also we can also do a social social media search. You know, sometimes if we do have fraudulent cases and somebody else say, hey, I'm living here and it's an apartment and then you go on their media um, and you see them. Oh, look at my house and you see a full house with a whole lawn and stuff like that. So, you know, these are things that we use to try to put pieces together and try to figure out, in fact, you know, what's really going on with families. And then, of course, we do home observations and dual observations um, because you know we want to see where the child is coming out of. Is the child coming out of the address um, in focus? And um, you know we'll see it. Or sometimes if we have, if we are lucky enough to have another suspected address, the uh, PPWs will either work together or the PPW and the residency investigator. One will go to the address and focus, and the other will go to the address suspected, and we just see who's coming out. You know, and our, you know our PPWs are so great. So I've, you know, I have some staff. They'll go out late to see, you know, if the car is there. If we, if we have that information. So a lot of times it just depends on the information that we're able to obtain. If we have a driver's license and um, an MBA tag number so we can see where in fact the child is coming from. I will tell you it's, it's always challenging when you have um, 
shared domiciles and it's like grandma or grandpa, you know, because they're never going to give up their grandchild. You know what I mean? So you're never going to get return mail from grandma or grandpa. Um, and even if the parent is living elsewhere, those are the most challenging cases when it's a family member. But, you know, we do our due diligence and to, to figure out an investigation as best we can. And sometimes we are good to say, you know, this is a solid case and, and the child should be recommended for withdrawal. And sometimes we'll say we don't have enough evidence to support a withdrawal of a student. But these are the techniques and tools that we use. Next slide, please. So this is the total amount of uh, residency investigations for last year. Um, we had uh, 1532 total that we had um, in residency investigations. Um, we broke it down by area. The Southwest area had 315. The Northwest area had 270. Central had 169. Northeast had 292. Southeast had 486 for our total of 1532. Um, in, ter in terms of uh, uh, um, disciplinary, not disciplinary, sorry, wrong words. In terms of schools, um, elementary had 1032, middle two, 289, and high school 206 in terms of investigations for the last school year. And with that, that is the end of the PowerPoint. Great. Thank you very much for that. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, we're kind of tag teaming here. Ms. Hamlet had some technical dish, uh, issues, and so we're kind of here together. Um, I just wanted to add, I believe, Mr. Handy, when this request for a presentation first came about, there was a request that residency investigations be disaggregated in some kind of way based on the students at the center of those investigations. Was that true? Yes, Dr. Roberts, okay. that's correct. And, and, then, and I, uh, just wanted, yeah. I just wanted to speak to why we don't have that information. Um, up until this point, we have not considered having this information disaggregated in any kind of way. But I will say uh, with this request, this has become an area of growth for us uh, so that we can be cognizant of whether or not our investigations are skewed in any kind of way. As Ms. Hamlet said, often we get re requests for investigations in a number of ways. They come by email from school administrators, Sometimes it's a conversation. And so what we are doing right now is we're working with the Department of Research Accountability and Assessment to standardize our referral process. We're trying to digitize that process so that there becomes a trail. And with that, we will be capturing moving forward demographic information on the students who are at the center of those investigations. So I just wanted to share that this has become an area of growth for us and we are working to make sure that in the future we can respond uh, with this kind of information. Okay, great. Thank you for that follow-up information. Um, that's very useful in our, because um, I'm sure uh, board members have questions, but um, that was very, very helpful. Um, Mr. Haney, was there an additional presentation or is, or, um, is... Uh, no, no, Ms. Scott, so this is the only presentation. Um, the only other agenda item uh, was just talking about future presentations, really. So this, Okay, this yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. In regards to the PPW, I just didn't... Oh, no, I'm to sorry. Cut that off. Yeah, oh, got you, got you. No, this, this, was, this was the presentation, yes. This was the only one. Perfect, so we can ask questions now. Yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> so board members, if you have any questions, just uh, put it in the chat so I can make sure that um, I call on you. And if you're on the phone, um, just either text me or, or let me know so I don't leave anyone out. I mean, I can start off with uh, one. I was just curious why there were so many investigations in elementary school as opposed to the other levels, middle school and high school. It looked like it was a thousand, then it dropped down. I don't have the 
slide up there, but it looked like it went from a thousand and then dropped down to like. No, it, um, yeah, yeah there it was. Yeah, you, you, you know, I don't know have I don't know if I have the the best answer except for I know that elementary is is really uh, watching you know kids leave out get the bus not get the bus they're outside watching um, student behavior and they seem probably more parent contact and so. I would just venture to say it's probably because of the nature of elementary school in itself that they're just a little bit more attentive because they're younger. Um, I know they do a lot of mailing in elementary school, so maybe they're getting a lot more return mail. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure like exactly except for the fact that they're younger and that they seem to be just more attentive in watching these type of areas for students. And Ms. Scott, say, I, I, I would also add that once we get to a point where our referral process is digitized and we can request additional information, this might be something that we are better able to answer in the future when we standardize our referral process. Okay, yeah, because that just seemed drastic to go from a thousand to then 200 because yeah. I'm sure mm -hmm. <laughs> Middle school, you know, uh, uh, sends out a lot of information and, and everything as well. That just seemed like a, a you know, a, a really drastic difference. So I was just curious about that. But, but when you say that they're more likely, are you saying school personnel or or parents? I'm talking school personnel. A lot of most of our referrals come from school personnel. And a lot of times it will be I saw Johnny um, walk, uh, taking the bus and he should be a bus rider or Johnny told me he he slept today at a um, near the ballpark and there's no ballpark near the school. Like the students, they say things that trigger, the younger students say things that trigger, I uh, guess, more thought. Um, so these are just kind of things that I see when it's an elementary investigation versus um, middle school. Middle school, you know, they, the students might not speak, be speaking as much to those types of points. Um, so I, I just think it's the access to elementary and being younger children and um, that maybe that is what's driving it. But once again, once we get the power automated system, hopefully it'll give us better data. I would also add, I know from my time as an administrator, we were always reluctant to engage elementary school kids in some kind of question and answer session. Um, however, when it came to our secondary students, we felt more comfortable in saying, well, can you tell me what your address is? And so sometimes we were just able to eliminate the need for an investigation because we could have that contact with students. And so we try not to engage in those deeper conversations with our younger students. OK, also, Miss Scott, I just wanted to say that we have so many more elementary schools than we have high schools and middle schools, so that could um, um, be a, a result of the inflated number. Oh, OK, all right, all of this matters, but you'll uh, but OK, great. So I don't want to take up all the time. Um, it looks like Dr. Hager has a question. Um, yes, thank you. I was uh, very excited when I saw that this was the topic of the meeting today. Um, as you all know, in our quasi judicial role, we um, end up seeing a lot of cases that have to do with um, with residency. And one thing that comes up a lot is really understanding whether a family is experiencing unstable housing and what that uh, means for their residency. And so I I, I worry that our system is set up that um, under the assumption that people, you know, own a house, live in a house, you know, and then that's their residency versus, um, you know, getting evicted, temporarily living with a cousin, hoping to find, you know, an, another place to live. And um, the label homelessness or being homeless, you know, carries a lot of weight. And so I guess, uh, what what do you do in those situations where you, you clearly a family is experiencing just an unstable housing experience? due to you know things outside of their control um you know what, what's this what are the steps that you take in those situations well the first thing that we do is we provide professional learning for ppws around how to make a determination of, around homelessness and that includes sensitivity to the whole concept of 
homelessness. We also partner very closely with the Office of Title I, where there is a homeless liaison. And so we consult frequently with the homeless office and the resident, the homeless liaison who is in touch with the national organizations. And so we get a lot of guidance and support from the Office of Title I. And again, it's ongoing professional learning. PPWs meet monthly, and those monthly meetings are professional learning opportunities. So we're always reaching out to offices that touch a that have information around the work that we do. If we're talking about enrollment, we talk about educational options. So we reach out to that office. If we're talking about homelessness, we reach out to the Office of Homelessness. So we very much believe in collaborating. Our slogan here is better together. So we're always reaching out to those offices that have information that would help to inform the work of PPWs and homelessness is a part of that. Uh, we often say we want the red, the homeless liaison to be a part of our office because she is an unofficial PPW is where we're concerned. She attends all of our meetings. We reserve a segment at each one of our meetings for her to share information that will guide the work of the PPWs, and that includes being sensitive to that. And since the pandemic, we have seen a spike in the number of families who are uh, experiencing homelessness. And so again, we do our best to be responsive to those families in a sensitive way. And that means enrolling those students without delay. It means not asking for documentation around residency because they are not likely to have it. If you had to leave your home suddenly because of an eviction or what have you, and you left with only what you could carry, it might not include some of that documentation. So we are very sensitive to that and we try to meet families where they are. I would also say, Dr. Hager, I talked to um, our homeless liaison just yesterday and she shared a very interesting fact. Um, she was on the Baltimore County Roundtable, uh, Baltimore County Government Roundtable, and she said there has been an increase since the pandemic of middle class homelessness, particularly in Baltimore County. And so I don't have the actual numbers, but she um, it was it was not surprising for us because we do this work. But um, I think it's going to be surprising in Baltimore County as we as we support families and students. But there has been an increase in homelessness, which means we will, we will know that we will have more families um, in those homeless situations living with other people. So what was that term? Middle class poverty? They called it middle class poverty is what they called it. Now th this was really to, helpful. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, Dr. Hager, I just wanted to share that. Um, our enrollment liaisons or our um, secretaries at the school level also receive training around how to interact with parents when parents come to um, register their students. And so if that question, if they they respond with, yes, I'm homeless or yes, I'm, ex you know, I'm experiencing, I'm only here temporarily, then they know to contact the PPW to um, make sure that that family gets the support that they need. So not only do we provide training to our PPWs, we also provide training to our um, enrollment liaisons at the schools. So that and they I also couple, know how to respond. Staff is also provided training. So the homeless liaison ensures that when I say staff, I'm talking about school level staff, um, that they are trained on um, McKinney Vental and the homeless process as well. And this this was all really helpful. And, and I have seen the forms um, just as a parent. It says, are you experiencing homelessness? And I, and I just worry that families may not check that box because they think, oh, well, I'm not homeless. I'm staying with a friend just to, until I get back on my feet or, you know, kind of one of those situations where where, um, you know, you, you don't identify as homeless, but are experiencing an unstable housing situation. Um, you know, and I, I, I genuinely appreciate all the answers that you provided. Um, and my last question is, um, I know you mentioned there were over uh, 1,500 investigations last year. How many PPWs do we have on staff? And um, generally, what is some, what, what kind of a person are you looking for who is a PPW? I remember the first time I learned that they did, you know, stakeouts. And <laughs> I was very surprised by that, uh, that level of, uh, you know, investigation that happens. So, so what kind of training are they getting and what kind of, uh, what kind of a background does a PPW typically have? 
we have presently 44 PPWs in our school system, and many of those PPWs were actually, I, I would say of the 44, 43 are either former counselors or former social workers. We have one who was actually a school administrator, and the PPW uh, title is a certificated position uh, title. So um, all of our PPWs have to obtain that certification from the state. And, you know, coming from a social work background or a counseling background, it certainly is very helpful. Uh, a lot, all of our PPWs demonstrate a level of passion and empathy for the families. You know, one of the things that I always talk to PPWs and our hearing officers about is we are here to sort of level the playing field. We are here to bring those students on the fringes into the fold. When we're talking about students who have recently arrived to this country who speak little to no English, or we're talking about students who have had to leave the only home that they've known because of a hardship or a kinship, or even students who've made a poor behavioral decision and now are sitting in front of the hearing officer because in a situation that is most uncomfortable for everyone, it is our job to make sure that we treat our students and our families in a way that is respectful and still continues to let them know that they are very much cared for. And so we are, what I say, we are the Olivia Popes of the school system. We swoop in and we do whatever it takes to fix the situation for students and families. That's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that the counseling and social work backgrounds, it's very clearly very important in this line of work. So thank you again for the presentation. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Great, thank you. And next we have Ms. Jose, and after that, Ms. Dolosky. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I find it really hard to believe that you have conducted investigations of over 1,500 people and you don't have a racial breakup of those investigations when you have a whole Office of Accountability and Research. That should be easily looked up on the students that were investigated and give us a chart. So that was something specifically, Mr. Handy, I requested, and I find it unacceptable that that is not presented. Um, that should be right there next to it when you're talking about equity. So, you know, I hear a lot of things, and like Dr. Hager said, we sit in the quasi-judicial role, and we've seen the investigations that have come in. Uh, staking out is not something that's funny or to be laughed at. You're staking children that are already traumatized, that are poor, that are homeless. And are we using private investigators for this, or is this being done by our PPW workers? I have seen residency calls for people in Perry Hall just because they're Black. So they must be living in the city. So when you come in here and, and give me all these things, know that we're coming in. I know a lot of the background information that happens. Um, this residency requirements that are going on, you're talking about proof of home ownership. If somebody is homeless, they don't have a job. They can't get a lease. They can't get an apartment. So what are we doing to, when you talked about level the playing field? And I hear a lot of um, buzzwords in there, but I need to see that in action. The fact that the breakup of the racial breakup of all of these students, the 1,532 students that are investigated was not provided, uh, is unacceptable to me. I need that data tomorrow in the weekly update. Uh, Ms. Scott, if you could facilitate that, please. And I want to know the school residency investigations that are done. Who conducts that? Is Are we hiring private investigators that are no, taking ma'am. No, ma'am. The, the PPWs and our residency investigators are who the persons who conduct the residency investigations. So that, that is my staff that conducts the residency investigations. The other thing that I would add, uh, just prior to the pandemic, we were already in the process of modifying or revising Rule 5150 because we recognized that there are some unintentional processes in there that we might want to revisit. Once the pandemic occurred, a lot of what we suspected about marginalizing students unintentionally uh, we want it to fix already. And so we very much want to undertake 5150 and look at it through an equity lens. Um, 
because we want to make sure that we're not even unintentionally marginalizing students. But but you are intentionally marginalizing children, and I'm glad that you see that that there is room for improvement. What is your next course of action? I, I need to see actionable items. I'm just hearing a lot of things, and we we see this, we see that, but what are we doing about it? Are you bringing in uh, the policy changes to the board? Are you bringing in um, SOPs that your office will follow to make sure that the marginalized and the disenfranchised are not again um, penalized for being poor? So that to me is important. Um, I'm glad that you see that we are actually marginalizing and marginalized, but I want to see actionable items. I want to see the demographic breakup. Um, and this is something that I feel very passionate about, as you can hear from my voice. So I want to see this thing. And Ms. Scott, as the chair, I am requesting that you please provide follow up on this, please. Thank you. Ms. Jost, um, this is Kim Ferguson. So at the top of the, the presentation, Dr. Roberts did share that moving forward, we're working with our um, DRAA and our DOIT representatives to make sure that our referrals do include the demographic information that we need. We recognize that th when we received this request and we shared this with Mr. Handy, that we did not have this information um, by demographics, um, but we were asked to present anyway the um, investigation process. So we certainly um, are working to make sure we get you the information that you've requested. Um, moving forward, um, and we, we shared that information at the top of the hour, um, and, and that is that is our pledge to do so moving forward. And also, Ms. Jones, I just want to say you you talked about homelessness and um, enrollments. Those students are enrolled without documentation. So once a student is identified homeless, they are enrolled. I get that, but like Dr. Hughes has said, sometimes they're not identified as homeless and those students have been kicked out or they've had PPW sitting outside their house at six in the morning, stalking them for hours on end. So what are we doing to make sure that these children are not bearing the burden of their adult parents' decisions or lack of? Um, the burden is being borne by our children, not by the parents of the adults. And to me, that is unacceptable. Um, the fact that most of this investigation happened in the city. I can get a breakdown of the demographics for you just as a guesstimate and somebody that does data all day, uh, but I really want to see the data. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Uh, next we have Ms. Stoluski. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. I especially want to appreciate all of your sensitivity and tact with regards to homeless students. Um, I do agree with Dr. Hager that um, if there's anything that can be done to um, raise awareness about possible homelessness when it comes to students who are living with a cousin or a friend and don't um, uh, recognize that that counts as homelessness, maybe to raise awareness about what would qualify, I think that would be wonderful. Um, thank you for all of your work. The only question that I have is um, I know that there were um, 1,532 investigations, um, and of course each um, student that is unlawfully enrolled in BCPS is obviously costing the school system a lot of money. Um, what is the total number of students that were um, uh, determined to to be unlawful, where they then had to disenroll in the school system. Thank you. We don't have that number available, but we will see what we can do to try to find out that number. I also wanted to say around students experiencing homelessness, families do not have to come into a school or enter our office and use the word homeless. We um, are trained to hear a situation and then work with identifying the student as homelessness. So many of our families don't even use that word. They say things like what you said, or I'm living with my cousin, or we're here for a week here, and then we're somewhere else for another week. So they don't have to use the word homeless for us to recognize that they are experiencing that unstable housing. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Thank you. Were there any other questions? Um, I just wanted to know also what have uh, there was the recent equity report that was presented to the Board of Education at our last board meeting. I wasn't aware if you all had um, had the opportunity to read that, um, but I do know that when the report was given, it was said that in regards to absenteeism and suspensions and um, things of that nature, that there were uh, PPW workers who could assist or help with that. And so I guess I'm, I'm just not sure how that would happen. Could you all expand mm -hmm. upon that a little bit? Sure, our, our PPWs have always been involved in the process to monitor attendance. They monitor school-wide attendance, they monitor individual attendance, and then they address those attendance issues in a tiered fashion using a multi-tiered system of support. And PPWs, for the most part, work with schools around tier one. It's the PPWs become very much involved generally at the tier three level where they are working with individual students and families around the attendance issues. Our PPWs all serve on the school-wide attendance committees where they are working side by side, our school administrators to bring those students who are who have chronic absenteeism back to the school in a way that's going to, to benefit them. Okay, thank you. It looks like You're Dr. Welcome. Hager, there's a follow-up. Um, yes, um, just to follow up to Ms. Tulesky's question about the number, and I, I understand that you may not have a num the number out of the 1,500 that were uh, determined as uh, as not living within district. Um, is there a general percentage? I mean, is it about 10% of cases annually that are affirmed, or is it 50%, or, or can you can you ballpark that? And, and no, again, I understand Dr. you might Hager, not. I don't. I really would not want staff to ballpark right. anything. Um, just give us some time to get that information um, as a follow-up. Okay, um, and I have a, another question, uh, Ms. Scott, that's uh, diff on a, a different line of questioning. Can I, would you like me to ask that now or wait? Um, is it in regards to this presentation of PPW? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, sure. Yes, go ahead. Um, so I know we talked about uh, student-centered data that's not available. Um, I was wondering if you, um, and I know you don't have it prepared today, but also curious about if there's a uh, certain schools that have a, a higher percentage of students who are um, reported as being out of district. And I imagine, you know, geographic location is a big part of that, you know, depending on, you know, where a school system that's surrounded by what, five other school systems. So I can see why that, that may happen. Um, but um, but is, is that some, some, is that data that you collect? Are there certain schools that, you know, are, um, uh, you know, of, of high interest to your office or anything like that? We, we do not have that data. A student could be out of district for a number of reasons, not necessarily because they are fraudulently enrolled and we've discovered that. Sometimes it could be something as simple as a student enrolled at a particular school when he or she was living in that community and now the family has moved to another area and did not inform the school that they moved. So they could have moved from one part of Baltimore County to another part of Baltimore County and just not share that information. And so once that information, according to our policy and rules, that's a fraudulent enrollment that they did not disclose that information. So I just wanna be clear that all of our fraudulent enrollments are not associated with the student attending Baltimore County schools who should not be here. That's an excellent point. I, yes, thank you for making that point. I appreciate that, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. You as well. Okay, and Mr. Handy, it looks like the next item on our agenda uh, for the Board Equity Committee are topics for um, 2022 to 2023. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, and again, thank you to our presenters. Yes, yeah, so just wanted to get a, a sense of their topics um, that you all were looking to cover um, as a committee so I can start to uh, you know, work with staff uh, to compile those presentations for you all. Sure, certainly I can start. Um, and then we talked about this at the last meeting. 
Um, but my question was in regards to the council uh, making sure that they had the information that they needed because the budget process yep. is coming up so that they could fully participate. And I was wondering if that could be something that could also be presented either at the council meeting or the next committee meeting. OK, yes. OK, that way they're giving them the opportunity to ask questions, to follow up um, or to um, add to it. OK, got you right. And I've been in discussion with them about that. Uh, just need to check at that time when I checked the calendar was not posted yet. So just um, as soon as I get the dates, you know, I'll make sure I'll bring them along. But I did tell the uh, council members that we'll be uh, looking at, you know, that FY24 budget um, so we can prepare that information that you requested. Thank you. Uh, secondly, also the new teacher hirees, the, a lot of the summer outreach that was being done and in different and various ways. Um, I thought that we were going to have a report after August that would come in, so this would be a great time to have that to the recruitment efforts. Okay. Uh, what that sort of translated into and where it was done, basically a demographic breakdown of where it was done, what it translated into, and then the end result as to who was hired, which school, and um, all of that information. Okay. Yeah, we talked about that. I believe it was in May or June or July at the very beginning. Yep, I think it was. Yeah, it was May or June, right? From we had that recruit um, recruitment and retention presentation of HR, right? So I will follow up with uh, fellow staff members to get that for you. Thank you. Um, and board members, anything else that you would like to see in regards to equity? Ms. Goss, yes. Is that Ms. Jose? Yes, I would like to yes. get a follow up on this um, presentation that was done today with 2022 data presented um, in the following year. OK, is that something that. You would need additional information for us. Um, Mr. Handy, uh, Ms. Jose has said she would like follow up information. Right, so I'll so just make sure I'm clear, um, Ms. Scott and Ms. Joe. So you're looking for current year data, is that correct? Correct, yes. And you probably won't have that data until the end of the school year. So a follow-up presentation of this with the more robust numbers and corrective action plans that have been put into place um, in the agenda as well. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. OK, it looks like there's a comment from Ms. Hassan. Yes, thank you. Um, so I just um, first of all, thank you guys so much for all of the hard work you've been in. I appreciate it so much. I would definitely love to see um, discussion on ESOL students, um, perhaps a, an in-depth presentation on um, our ESOL programs, what that looks like in different schools, um, how students of color and from different nationalities are impacted by our ESOL programs, um, as well as talking about the digital divide um, and maybe menstrual equity as well. Those are just some topics that I personally would love to see come up in um, future committee meetings. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Hassan, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm taking notes too and I always check the recording, but could you repeat the last aspect you said? I know you yeah, said you wanted course. to include. Okay, yeah. No, you're good. Um, so I think the last one was menstrual equity. Just having students and access to period products, how that affects the school okay, day. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Ms. Stoloski. Thank you for the presentation. So Ms. Hassan and I just sat in on the curriculum meeting and um, they discussed the Ready to Read Act. And one of the components that they could not provide was um, students' readability and um, their assessments in terms of are they on grade level, are they receiving interventions? So they did pledge to break up the data by um, various groups. So um, certainly I think it would be valuable for this committee to get those results as well. And I'm sure they will be coming soon, 
um, but definitely want us to be able to follow up on that. OK, thank you. And so Mr. Lucy, just so I'm clear, so that was today's curriculum committee? Yes. OK, all right, so I'll review so, that and I'll connect with right. fellow staff on that. OK. Yep. And it sounds like they're going to need a little bit of time to compile that data, but mm -hmm. just want to make sure that it doesn't get lost in the in the shuffle. Thank you so much. Got you. Yep, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you for that, Ms. Dulesky. That'll be a good um, item for us to have. And um, oh, yes, Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. I, I just was thinking of a possible kind of cross committee um, activity or, or um, something like that with, with this policy 5150 that was discussed today and how it, um, you know, the folks in the office believe it needs to be looked at with an equity lens and, and potentially revised. Um, could there be some sort of equity committee PRC effort um, to to uh, or at least to ask PRC to prioritize that that policy in the coming year? I guess it's not a, not a presentation, but just something to, to potentially consider. Gotcha. OK, Dr. Hager, yeah, I'll follow up with uh, fellow staff on that. And really, I would say make sure we're applying equity lens, um, certainly as a, as a baseline, if you will. But I'll I'll check in with them on that as well and see what the you know proposed cycle is for review. Great, thank you. I I think that's important. Yeah, providing a equity lens to our policies, and um, yeah, I think that's important. Yeah, all very good. Good things. I'm glad that we do this at the end as far as <laughs> having all uh, you know board members input as to what they would like to see. It's important. Um, and one other item, Mr. Handy, is food, um, ethnic food diversity in our cafeteria. We've heard a lot from our constituents and from people in the community as far as food options. And so I wanted to know as far as having different ethnic foods that could be available in our cafeteria. What's the likelihood of that? Is that something that we could do? I mean, Dr. Hager may actually already know about this. <laughs> this is I'm kind of going into her wheelhouse. Bit, so I apologize <laughs> for that. No, it's but, it's a great topic. It's a it's an important topic, and uh, and it's it'd be it'd be a good thing to discuss about how how they can insert different new menu options and and the process that goes into that. Correct. Yeah, and. I, again, I don't pretend to be the expert, but I but I, I think that would be uh, as I've heard the curriculum and other areas where we talk about children seeing themselves in the diversity of reading and um, various things like that, but also perhaps in the diversity as well as food. So um, would that be something that we could explore in this committee? Uh, so I certainly can investigate. I've noted it um, and I can investigate that. OK, yes, the, the likelihood of doing that and um, ha maybe having a presentation on that and how we could make that happen. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. OK, anyone else? Great, OK, thank you. That looks like that's it for us, Mr. Handy. OK, thank you, Ms. Scott and uh, fellow uh, also another committee member. Then I do see Mr. Sons uh, comment in the chat too. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, thank you for that, Ms. Hassan. That's very um, important. Would you mind coming on and saying what you put in the chat? <laughs> of course, yeah, I'm a little bit of a menstrual equity buff. Um, I have a uh, one of my good friends, Hannah Oluni, um, pushed for these two, how this House bill and Senate bill. Um, but essentially, they were passed in the last um, legislative session um, because Governor Hogan did not sign them, which means they automatically turned into law after 30 days. And they basically um, provide free period free period products in every single school restroom, elementary, middle, and high school, in every girl's bathroom. I don't know the timeline on it specifically, um, but hopefully we get to start seeing those soon and, and see that implemented in our budget with the coming budgetary discussions. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. Of course, I'm happy to share. Thank you. Great. Any additional information? This is wonderful. <laughs> I 
So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Mr. Handy. Thank you, committee members. Yep. Um, the last item on the agenda is announcements and the next equity committee meeting will be held on Thursday, November 17, 2022 at 4 p.m. And the next equity committee meeting with the Equity Council will be held on Thursday, November 3rd, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. Um, is there any additional further business? All right, hearing none, then our meeting is adjourned. And thank you all very much for joining us. Have a good evening.